Hello and welcome everyone to the fourth webinar in our Catch the Wave series. My name is Louise Hosking, I'm the IOSH president and I will be your host for today. Our Catch the Wave campaign is a call for action. For work to be truly sustainable in the long term, we must put our people, their safety, their health and their well-being first. It is time for our organisations and our governments to stop viewing people as expendable, to be used, left exhausted, psychologically harmed by stress and trauma, or left in poor health due to the conditions they work within and the substances they are exposed to. It is time to stop accepting harmful exposures as normal or too hard to challenge compared to other corporate risks. At IOSH, we believe people should be placed at the first and centre of work. At IOSH, we believe we should care about how people feel and prevent injury and harm from work. When we put our people first, they will return our trust and step up, bringing their whole selves to work. It is via our people we will navigate the very many challenges we're facing in the world right now, so let's treat them well. Think of sustainability and we automatically think of the environment and climate change. In business, we understand sustainability is more than this as we balance people, planet and profit. Via our Catch the Wave campaign, we're demonstrating the role of occupational safety and health professionals within social sustainability and how we can articulate a business case for this agenda, which is embedded into organisational planning and governance as a golden thread across organisations of any sector, any size and anywhere. Today, we're going to explore a concept central to our thinking, worker wellbeing. It's a phrase which is being used more and more, perhaps without a clear understanding of what we really mean. During this session, we will discuss this, what value it has and how we measure it. In doing so, we will demonstrate, demonstrate why it is relevant to the OSH profession and importantly, the vital role which the OSH professional has in improving worker wellbeing. I'd like to welcome the three excellent panellists who are joining us today to consider these questions. First, I'd like to introduce Kelly, if you'd like to turn your video on Kelly. Kelly is Head of Diversity, Inclusion and Wellbeing for Fujitsu Northern and Western Europe. She's passionate about creating an environment where everyone can, fit, can be completely themselves at work. She is an advocate of the links between inclusion and employee well-being. Kelly has held several senior roles during her time at Fujitsu, including Head of Organisation Design and Change and Europe-wide HR Generalist roles. Kelly started her career at BAE Systems and has also spent time in global client management and responsible business roles. So welcome, Kelly. Our next panelist is Stephen Bevan. Stephen Bevan is Head of HR Research Development at the Institute of Employment Studies. He has almost 40 years of experience in the field of HR research with specialist expertise in workforce wellbeing, performance and productivity. At both IES and in his previous role as Director of Research at the Work Foundation, he has led a large number of projects for public and private organisations, both in the UK and internationally. He has advised governments on policy issues in several EU member states. Stephen is currently leading projects on work after lockdown for the Economic and Social Research Council. He is co-investigator at the Centre for Musculoskeletal and Health and Work at Southampton University and was an expert advisor to the UK's government's Thriving at Work review of mental health and employment. So very much welcome to you, Stephen. 
And our third panellist is Professor Anne Harris. Anne is immediate past president of the Society of Occupational Medicine. Anne has extensive teaching and course management experience at both London South Bank University, where she is Professor of Occupational Health, and previously at the Royal College of Nursing. She has driven the development of occupational health education and practice locally, nationally and internationally. Um, thanks for joining us, Anne. And I was listening to Anne at the Birmingham Wellbeing Conference yesterday. So it's great to have you on my session today, Anne. So um, thank you to everyone for joining us. So I'm going to jump straight in with some set questions that we have, um, but we also have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, and I will come to those later on in the session. So do pose your questions within the Q&A box um, for the panel. So Earlier webinars in this series have looked at the contribution that good occupational safety and health can make to organisations' competitive advantage and encourage businesses to incorporate OSH into their long-term strategic planning and governance. Our focus in this webinar is on worker wellbeing. I think intuitively we all know what well-being at work means. We probably have varying understandings that it's about how people feel about themselves in terms of their levels of happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, self-worth and value. I'm sure many on the call are familiar with Maslow's idea of self-actualization in which the individual is able to realize their full creative and human potential. And perhaps we can suggest that these concepts of well-being and self-actualization are not too far away from each other. So to start off my questioning, um, I think it's worth us stating that by re-examining what we mean by the term worker well-being, um, so I'd like to really ask each of our panelists in turn, um, if they could each identify one or two aspects that we should include in our understanding of the term worker well-being. So I'm going to just go around my tiles um, and Kelly, if I could start with you. Thank you, Louise. And, and first of all, just a comment, because I've been keeping up, up with uh, the introductions that people have been making to themselves in the chat. And it's brilliant to have such a mix of people part of this conversation today. So uh, thank you, everybody, for being with us. And um, what 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 would I define um, worker well-being to be? Very simply, it's about the positive health culture that you create within an organisation. And to break that down a little bit, I would then um, say that that is is about the environment that you create within the organization that enables people to achieve a healthy balance across four key components. A healthy balance in terms of their physical and mental, social and financial health. And what's critical for me is that those four things are not independent of each other. They're a jigsaw. And those, those four factors all need to be and um, need to be addressed to create that culture of, of positive worker well-being. So I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more as we get into some of the questions about how do we make sure that we're paying attention to all of those different um, facets of well-being in equal measure. Thanks Kelly and Stephen if I could ask you the same question. Yeah I think um, I agree very much with what Kelly was saying. I, I mean I, I, if now we're into quoting um, um, organizational psychologists from the 50s. How about um, Frederick Hertzberg, uh, who said that uh, if you want people to do a good job, give them a good job to do. Um, and when you start unpacking what a good job is, I think we might get towards um, some of the definitions of what um, well-being outcomes we want. Because I think if people have, have jobs where they feel able to flourish, they're able to grow, they're able to use their skills, um, where they have a sort of animating purpose, um, then I think we're we're closer to getting a, a wider sense of what well-being is. 
um, I think what we need to avoid is um, over medicalizing um, well being. Um, it's very easy to sort of come up with sort of diagnostic terms for the different ailments and uh, issues that people um, and challenges that people face. And obviously that plays a part. Uh, but I think well-being is broader than that, and it is about people's ability to flourish at work. Thank you. And, and Anne, the same question to you, worker well-being. Mm, that, that's so interesting. Um, often health is considered by non-healthcare professionals as just the absence of disease. But in fact, it isn't just the absence of disease. It's looking at that person as a biopsychosocial kind of organism. Um, I, I'll just bring something from my practice from a quite a long time ago now, where there was a nurse working in a community setting who had so many health problems. It was unbelievable. She had severe diabetes that she'd had since a child. She got kidney problems as a result of these the, the um, initial diabetes, lots of comorbidities, you would not say she was well at all. However, her well-being was off the end of the Richter scale because she loved being at work. That gave her meaning. She liked being with patients and she was a fantastic worker. So although she didn't have good health, she had excellent well-being. And part of that was her intrinsic love of a job but more than that, it was a very good manager who would nurture her and promote her so that she, when I say promote, I don't mean promote through the promotion, but enabled her to give the best of her professional ability in the workplace. That's what gave her life meaning. And if we look at Waddell and Burton, they say work should be good for your health. And I would say that is absolutely correct. If it's good work, with a good manager so that's me yeah fantastic and so it just developing these ideas then um i think perhaps um it's worth us spending just a few moments to ask ourselves what we think about the experience of work um and whether you each of the panelists can give some pointers on what they think you know, really expanding on what um, Anne was saying, you know, is this about earning a living um, or is work a place that's that's more than that? And, um, you know, perhaps if you can sort of unpack that a little. So if, if I can come to Kelly first of all. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I love Anne's, and Stephen's thoughts about managers as well, because I truly believe that they play such an essential role in creating the circumstances for worker well-being and um, work is so much more or has the potential to be so much more than simply making a living and paying the bills so we and we can all consider that for a moment for ourselves why do we get up to go to work in the morning what is it that makes us get up with a smile on our faces as opposed to trudging into wherever our workspace happens to be and um, Work is a really important part of our identity. It's about contributing to something that is bigger than ourselves. It's about contributing to a shared purpose and meaning. And we can't do that alone. It's about self-fulfillment and self-development. And it's also about having fun. It's about social mm. connection as well. And I think we've especially experienced that in the last couple mm. of years where we've been forced to remove ourselves from being co-located with colleagues in, in, many, um, in many roles and many sectors. And, and we've really realised just how much of a social component there is to work as well. So those are, those are some thoughts for me about what more work is than just simply getting the job done and paying the bills. So, um, Stephen, coming to you with that same question. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it comes back a bit to some of your introductory comments, Louise, about you know, people not just being units of production. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, you know, obviously, organisations have to balance this, don't they? They, they want um, a healthy and productive workforce. Um, they want the workforce to contribute to uh, the outputs and the services, for example, that an organisation offers. Um, but they also have a responsibility that goes beyond their legal duty of care um, to try and provide them with a working environment 
which is satisfactory, um, fulfilling, motivational and so on. Um, and we've been at IES, we've been doing quite a lot of surveys of people during the last two years during the pandemic, um, particularly people who've been working from home, not exclusively. Um, but we have noticed a bit of a shift or at least people becoming a little bit more explicit about what it is they want about work. Um, and it's very clear that, that most people see work as, as a social as well as an economic activity. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of people who felt isolated during the, the pandemic um, have really missed working with colleagues. And some of that's not necessarily to do with the work itself. It's just about the informal social connection. Um, but it is also to do with um, what you might call micro interactions that people have, you know, where they're swapping knowledge and know how with people in informal settings and serendipitously. I think the other thing is that um, people have learned that actually the thing they do value about work is being trusted uh, to get on with their jobs. And mm. if, you, if you've been working more remotely um, and your managers only had, um, you know, relatively little to do with setting your objectives and monitoring your performance, um, and has had to trust you to get on with your job, then being in a job where you have control and autonomy, you have some discretion over when and where you do your work. Uh, I think a lot of people really enjoyed that. Um, and then, in fact, a lot of managers um, who perhaps five years ago would say, oh, we couldn't possibly have this mass migration to mm -hmm. remote working. We couldn't possibly work in our organisation. They proved to themselves they can manage in those circumstances. And so I think there's been quite a lot of learning and a realisation that work is not just about, you know, uh, ticking off things on a, on a list or contributing to a narrow measure of productivity. It's something wider than that. Yeah, it's, it's like we're really unpacking why we like to work, isn't it? Um, and I don't know um, if Dimple in the background can put a link into the chat box because we, um, before the pandemic, IOSH published a really excellent white paper on why good work is good for people. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you can um, give your perspective on this as well, Anne. Yeah, um, I've worked in one organisation where I was exceedingly well paid had lots of nice perks that get went with it, but I couldn't hack it because I was bored. Mm -hmm. They weren't using me to the best of my potential. I was, for what I was doing, I was overpaid. Well, nobody's going to complain about having too much money, but what it wasn't doing was engaging my brain. So I had to sit down because at the end of the day, we've all got bills to pay. We all have other financial issues that we have to deal with for me. One of my biggest expenditures is holidays. And I was thinking, if I stop this job, will I still be able to have all these exotic holidays? And I decided that the holidays are fantastic. But if I was just going into work for drudgery, it's not worth it. Mm. I was very lucky that I was in a position where I didn't have to stay. Other people aren't so lucky. And I think if that organisation had thought about their recruitment policy right at the beginning, recruited the right person for the right grade of job, or alternatively, um, think about how they could use my skills more productively, but they wouldn't. We were very, that's your job and that's all you do. They didn't facilitate expansion of my role. So sad because they, did, they ended up losing somebody who was a, a good employee because they weren't being fully engaged with their job requirements. Yeah, and from a business perspective, there's a really practical element to that, isn't there? Because, um, you know, if you run a business, um, you know, particularly if you run a small business, if you lose somebody within that business, you absolutely feel that massively. And, and bringing people on and nurturing them through their career, that's not an easy thing to do. And you translate that out into a supply chain as well, and it, it becomes even greater. So, so that sense of, of of well-being and you know positivity is, is what's going to drive us forward um, so that's really interesting so my next question then is um all around um you know we've talked about satisfaction um and and this is kind of a complex area really about how people feel about themselves how they relate to others how they relate to their managers leader leaders and so on so we're in sort of general align alignment in respect of um of what this all means but but it is a massively complex moving issue um 
how do we measure all of this? How do we kind of measure it? How do we understand where we are? Um, Kelly, perhaps you can kick us off with, with making it a bit more subjective in terms of meaning. For sure. And across so many areas of an employee's experience at work, I talk about the power of two things combined. So the power of how we use our data and how we gather insight and stories. And I think that applies equally to well-being as to many other topics. So what insight can we gain to understand how people are experiencing their work with our organisation. And I'll give you some specific examples of what we, what we use at Fujitsu. So in terms of our insight, we get that from different sources. We do a twice yearly engagement survey. And in that survey, we have three specific questions that we use as the barometer of employee wellbeing. And those questions are, Fujitsu genuinely cares for my well-being equally as significant as the score that people give to that question is all of the comments that they get, they then give underpinning why they're, they're giving that particular response i feel supported to integrate my work and life priorities and i have opportunities to have a fulfilling career in this organization so that for us that's one big source and we use that globally of insight around worker well-being we then have more local measures. So also within the UK, we, we invite all employees to give 180 feedback about their people managers, recognising the essential role that managers play in so many areas of our experience at work. But we specifically ask people to give feedback about the extent to which their manager looks after their well-being. And we do that deliberately because a manager simply paying attention, properly listening to their people, properly seeking to understand that individual's circumstances, where they need, may need support to thrive at work, that can make a massive difference. And then the second area that we look at is the data. What are these more measurable things? I think if we were having this conversation maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 years ago, we may be looking at things like absence data reasons for absence, but exactly to Anne's point earlier, that in itself is not an indicator of well-being. That's a little bit of the jigsaw. I would be putting into that, what's our retention rate, mm. especially at the moment when all organizations are really um, struggling to grapple with this great reset that we're going through and many people questioning what they want out of their work and choosing to vote with their feet in some circumstances. So how effective are we at retaining people? And when we're going out to the recruitment market, what's our brand? What is it that people are hearing from current and former employees that is causing them to want to join or not to join our organisation? And then some of the other measures we, we use at Fujitsu are to what extent are employees engaging with those formal um, wellbeing programmes that we put, we put in place for them? And um, we've seen perhaps unsurprisingly, a very substantial increase in usage, usage of our employee assistance programme in the last couple of years. And we monitor that by diverse group as well, which has been really interesting. So it's, it's that jigsaw of different measures that then build a really comprehensive picture of worker yeah, wellbeing. I, I think off the back of, of everything that we're going through, there's going to be so much research into all of those aspects that you've spoken about. Um, I mean, in terms of retention, because I think from a business perspective, it's really easy to see the cost on the business if you've got a high turnover of people, which gives us an opportunity as, as professionals to, to demonstrate the positive effects of this. Um, when people actually do leave, um, do you have a process in respect of that to capture information about why they're leaving as well? We, we, we certainly do. And again, a, a, part of, a really important part of my role. So I have two responsibilities, inclusion and well-being. Mm. And those two things for me really do go hand in hand. If we feel 
included and able to be ourselves at work that is such a contributor to our well-being and so when we when we gather data we not only look at our exit interview feedback for example and what are the reasons that people are leaving but we understand that for diverse groups of people so we can start to see are there, where where may there be differences in experience between particular groups of workers and where do we need to specifically focus our our attention um, so although, although that this isn't directly related to in an exit situation, one of the things we've noticed through doing that is that whilst we're a male dominated workforce, the, the uptake of our employee assistance programme was notably lower for men compared to women. When we introduced the opportunity for people to engage with mental health services using an app, as opposed to actually ringing up um, and also with a with you know with other groups where we've opted people in rather than given them the opt out you know whether, rather than giving them you make the call we've seen usage go up for those those groups so so i think that's a really important part of the jigsaw as well is to understand that um, difference in diverse groups and then to tailor your well-being approach accordingly I, I love that. I think there's some really um, great, so, you know, wins in terms of how, you know, we're looking at this from a psychological perspective and, and all of those different pieces, it's, it's just looking at everything through a psychological lens. Why aren't people engaging? And you're clearly picking that up as well. It's really interesting. Stephen, if, if I could come to you and, and ask you um, the same question about data and information and and perhaps expand that a little bit to sort of understand how we can involve our people in all of this so that they feel that it's not just about the numbers but there's actually something behind this as well yeah um i mean i think lots of organizations a lot more organizations i think recently have, have got into the habit of collecting data um from their employees and i think that's great um I suppose the real um, holy grail that we're all looking for is to try and find those measures of people's experiences or their perceptions or their feelings, where you can be pretty sure that if people hold those um, views, um, that they then translate most reliably into behaviours or out health outcomes. Um, so you can, you can ask people questions where they will passively give you an answer to say whether they've got an opinion for or against something. But if that doesn't, at the end of the day, translate into a behaviour that as a business we're interested in, um, then it's only of limited value. So, for example, um, if you take most measures of job satisfaction, um, they're quite a useful way of, of getting a general me measure of the level of morale uh, in an organisation. But actually, most of the research shows that job satisfaction is only weakly linked to some of the behaviours we want. So, you know, whether people come to work or not, uh, whether they're off sick, whether they leave or not. Uh, whether they perform, for example. It's not unrelated, but it's not as strong or reliable as you'd like. Um, I think more recently we've had measures of things like organisational commitment, um, which I think are slightly better because they do translate more reliably into, into behaviours. Um, so whether or not people, for example, identify strongly with their job, whether they feel pride in the organisation they work for, whether they feel their, their values are aligned with those of the, their employer. And organisational commitment, I think, is in general shown to be a better predictor of whether people want to continue to be part of your organisation, for example, uh, or whether they're prepared to put extra effort in um, to perform on your behalf. Um, and then there's a, there's a few others. So I think things like control and autonomy, I've mentioned before, there are studies, for example, most notably the Michael Marmot studies looking at um, the health of civil servants. What he found was that um, in hierarchical organisations, people in lower level jobs who have less control um, also have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And if you, even if you control for um, things like smoking and other lifestyle behaviours, that relationship between control and health outcomes is still pretty strong. It's also linked to things like depression and anxiety. And we also know from some of the research that's been done in manufacturing companies, for example, that if people have a high level of um, feeling that they're in control of, of, of what they do. They can work much more intensively uh, for longer periods of time under high pressure. And actually, that's what a lot of organisations want. They want to do that in a way that remains healthy and, and minimises risk to individuals. But you're doing, you're doing it in a way that is uh, building on 
the individual's um, strong desire to be motivated, engaged and in control of what they're doing. So I think there's a sort of a hierarchy of different measures that we can use. Um, and I think I would urge organisations to use sort of surveys and pulse surveys and so on to ask yourself the question, which of the measures that we're collecting data on are the ones that are translating into, into behaviour or health outcomes? Because they're the ones that are going to be most useful to you. I think the other, the, back to your other question, Louise, about how you involve employees in all this. I mean, I think that um, a useful model that I've used before is one called the job demands and resources model, which basically says for any one job, uh, there'll be a number of demands on, of, on the person for being in that job. They may be physical demands in terms of you know, the risk of strain or stretching or lifting heavy weights and so on. There might be psychological demands. Um, but actually, if the individual has all the resources they need to meet those demands, so they have support, they have um, assistive technology, they've got a good manager, they've got close colleagues, they've got good training and so on. Actually, even in demanding jobs, people can have the resources to, to meet those demands. And so I think that um, some of the approaches I've seen working in some companies is where they've involved employees much more explicitly in helping them to do things like, you know, looking at systematic approaches to assessing risk exposure to psychosocial risk, for example, which involve employees much more. So you get into a dialogue with them about what is it about the job or is it a particular point in the cycle of the job um, that causes you most pressure or where you feel that you're more exposed um, to perhaps making bad decisions or coming to psychological harm of some kind. And doing that in a way that co-produces a good outcome um, can be a really useful way of, of adding legitimacy to what you're doing and making sure that you know, health, safety and well-being is not something you do to people, you're doing it with them. And I think there are some really good examples from the, the tech industry, the automotive industry, which are much more participative and allow employees to get much more involved in not just identifying risk, but actually deciding what the risk factors are that they need to be monitored. It's really interesting. So, so there's evidence out there to demonstrate that if you have an, a culture of autocratic leadership, that you can directly measure that back to, um, you know, issues in respect of, you know, that will indicate through within your organisation. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think there's quite a lot of evidence. I mean, you know, you think about it back in the days of Henry Ford. Um, you know, he wasn't one for uh, enrichment at work. Um, you know, he was just really interested in paying people um, to get the cars off the production line and give them enough money so they could go and buy his cars. And that was all he was interested in. He wasn't into job enrichment particularly. But now, you know, the workforce in the UK and in across many of the countries represented by the participants to this webinar are more highly educated. They're not prepared to just take orders. Um, they want to know why, they're, what they're expected to do things in a certain way, and they feel, have an expectation that they should be involved in decisions that affect them. And this is all part of this concept of good work, you know, that people should feel that their leadership is, a, is as inclusive as possible in, in decision-making, um, that people are having things explained to them. And if there are better ways of doing them, that they should be able to um, put their hand up and say, well, actually, we think that we should be doing it this way instead and for those suggestions to be listened to. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, autocratic leadership, which is not prepared to listen to alternative ways of doing things or give people discretion over the way they do their work, is not in the long run going to have um, a healthy workforce nor a productive one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, my argument around that has always been, you know, we're in this massively changing world where we're facing so many challenges and we can't possibly have enough rules to cover all of those things. So it just starts to, to really um, fall apart with that kind of leadership thing. Um, so, Anne, so the same kind of questions to you around um, data and, and perhaps you can put on your experiences you know we've talked about larger companies uh, can, do you have anything that you can offer in terms of your experience from from perhaps smaller companies i think looking at turnover and why you lose employees why they leave at very specific times of the year that they're leaving is that linked with anything you're doing in the workplace i am aware of an organization that took on board uh, I, I'm 
engaged an employee engagement advisor. And she was very experienced in HR. They took her on. She gave them lots of very constructive feedback, but they didn't like the feedback and they had no intention of doing anything with it. She became disillusioned and thought, I'm, I'm not being listened to. They've engaged me to do this. They're not really interested. It's all paying lip service. Off she went and they did nothing to actually consider why they were having the issues that they were having on absence, turnover and so on. So I think it's looking at the whole totality of the workplace, looking at the quality of managers, looking at what support they get. Often middle managers are the jam in the, in the sandwich. They're being pushed from on high and they've also got to manage sometimes some very challenging staff, but they're not given the support themselves. Uh, they may have employees that they are responsible for that have developed work-related stress kind of issues, but they don't even know how to do a stress risk assessment or what to do about it. But what they'll then think about is, oh, well, let's do some mental health first aid training. Mm. Now, that to me is just like having a poorly guarded machine where people are putting their fingers in and having them chopped off and then having a huge supply of ambulance dressings that you then apply. If you looked at why it was going wrong in the first place and repair the machine, you would not have so many broken people and so many used dressings. So that's that's my, my hint is get managers thinking about mental health, not just about having mental health first aiders, but train them to understand what in the workplace could have an adverse effect on mental health. I think um, health and safety practitioners have done a lot to control physical, chemical, mechanical, biological factors in the workplace to stop people getting those kinds of, of issues like losing fingers in poorly guarded machinery. And I'm really pleased to talk to safety professionals who are now thinking about the mental health issues too. But there's a um, just staying with you on that one, Anne. There's, um, you know, there there is a school of thought. Is you know, is this a is this a role for the health and safety professional? Um, my personal view is yes, it is because you know we've got those skills to risk assess. But perhaps you can um, talk about that as well. Is, is it you know in terms of health and safety law, for example, you know where does that all fit in? Oh, I could wax lyrical on that. <laughs> First of all, there is a duty of care under Section 2 of the Health and Safety at Work Act for those of people in the UK. Um, obviously, overseas, you may have your own health and safety legislation, but to do uh, to have that duty of care and to then think about doing risk management approaches, then within that, we've got the six pack and the management regs. Regulation 3 requires you to do those um, risk assessments. Then you think about the HSC website and mental um, health and so on. And I think that the health and safety professional is very, very good at, at being integral in, into pushing those, um, those risk management approaches. They're not necessarily all, although many will be, uh, but they're not all necessarily geared up to, well, what can we do? on the more health side rather than the safety side. I remember when I did my MSc, I chose the health and safety pathway because I already had the, a nursing qualification in occupational health. And I remember one of the module leaders correcting me when I was talking about occupational health and safety. And he said, no, no, it's occupational safety and health. Well, I didn't argue with him, <laughs> but where does the health finish and the safety starts? I believe in working within a multi-professional team and I value health and safety professionals, but it might be that the health and safety professionals identify there's an issue, can do the risk management and so on, but it might be that they say, actually, let's bring Anne in to do more on the mental health issues. So I see it working as a, an integrated team where we've each got a, a part to play. Some people may be better on one, element and others may be more focused on a slightly different facet it's an ultimate well it's the ultimate team sport it's a contact sport as well isn't it so yeah mm -mm. so um kelly i'm going to come to you and i'm going to start to 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 go off our set questions now because there's some interesting questions coming up in the q a box 
Um, and there's a few sort of similar questions about pressure and workloads with changes. So um, Darren says, and I completely agree with you, Darren, that we're definitely pushing on an open door in respect of this, but it still feels like slightly a, a kind of a, a, a tick box exercise. Um, we've got um, someone on here who's, who they're going through, um, Alan's looking at, um, they're going through a merger in respect of two colleges and bringing in two different sets of people. So, so all of this is sort of coming through and there's an amalgamation of different things. Um, Kelly, from your perspective, can you give any advice in respect of that? In terms of, you know, where do we start? And, and how do we, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do we kind of tackle these things that might come in sort of left of centre? How do we stop it from being a tick box exercise? So well-being for me is about is about the culture that you have within the organisation. And there are many different things that create the culture. And um, leadership is, is, is a key one, the way that we're organized, the way that we're structured, the way that jobs are designed, the level of autonomy that people have, but also at an individual level through our own behaviors and choices, we can contribute to that, to that culture as well. But I think if there's a sense that we're doing lots of stuff and it feels like a tick, a tick box exercise, then for me, the first put of call has to start with your leadership. So what are those, if, if we can't win the heart argument, if we can't get the moral and ethical buy-in that it's just the right thing to do because we're going we're, we're gonna to have a more positive contribution to people's lives and to society through sustaining worker well-being, then let's flip that question on its head. Where are the pain points in our organisation? Where are we finding it difficult to recruit at the moment? Where are we losing people too quickly? Where is productivity going down? Where are we seeing more accidents because of people working longer hours? So, so re it's, it's, for me, it's got to be about getting leadership to really understand some of the challenges that we will no doubt be facing when we're not paying attention to worker wellbeing, but it's always about the context. So it's about being clear what, what is it that is specific to your own organisation, whatever sector you're working in, whatever, whatever size of that, and make it really real for your leaders. So put it into those quantitative indicators to get, to get their attention. Yeah, and, 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 and I would probably add to that, you know, get to know the governance structure within your organisation, mm -hmm. particularly if it's a larger organisation, because actually if you follow the processes that are there and can demonstrate that positivity, it makes a huge difference. So, um, yeah, coming to you um, next, Stephen, we've got, again, we've got a few similar questions coming through. So two different Ians, Ian Scott and Ian Everson are asking similar questions around um, long hours and fatigue and workers wanting to work longer hours um, and certainly shift patterns and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if you've got any views and comments around that, those areas. Yeah, I guess it, that's a sort of manifestation, I suppose, of some aspects of the culture and the leadership that uh, Kelly was talking around. Um, I, I spoke to a very senior manager in a UK organisation during the pandemic, and his view was that um, stress at work um, was a far better driver of productivity than any well-being program. Um, and um, so I think that's a sort of illustration of the fact that some leaders are really good at uh, making the right noises about well-being at work, but when push comes to shove, they're most interested in squeezing out as much productivity as possible. Um, and that the ends justify the means. Um, and I think, you know, lots of people work in organisations where long hours are the norm. Um, and there's a sort of cultural expectation. Uh, I did some work for a pharmaceutical company a few years ago where um, everyone stayed in the office until 10 minutes after the chief executive left for home. Um, and um, he couldn't work out why you know, everyone was still there at eight o'clock in the evening when he was. Um, and they pointed out to him that his behaviour was sending a signal about 
um, you know, what was expected. Um, and of course, one of the things that the, the, the working from home experiment is, is identified very clearly is that um, what you produce is far more important than how long you spend doing it. Um, and lots of organisations have learned that, you know, focusing on outcomes and outputs is far more important than inputs. Um, and so I think you know, we can use well-being arguments um, and the data we're collecting from you know, monitoring psychological health and so on to identify that, you know, um, working long hours can be damaging to people's health. It can, you know, fatigue has been one of the big challenges during the pandemic. It's the one thing that we've been measuring um, that has gone up um, rather than down since the beginning of lockdowns. Um, and so I, I do think that, um, you know, things like sleep quality, things like, um, you know, people's um, underlying psychological health are really very important. And if you see people are working very long hours, um, even though you know they're not required to, but because there's a cultural expectation, you can argue argue that's a lead indicator of something more uh, pernicious going on in the organisation. You really really need to root out. Brilliant. And Anne, you've got your hand up. Yeah, you I have. Take off on that one. Um, I'm just going to take my hand down so I don't have an old hand later. I think what you've just been saying, Stephen, is superb. The comment made by the senior manager stroke executive about uh, being a bit of stress is better for productivity than well-being strategies. I would have liked to know what his well-being definition is. And I wonder many people when you mention well-being think about things like fresh fruit on friday pilates a bit of mindfulness um and I, that those kinds of touchy feely things that is for me the icing on the cake but if you don't have a good cake underneath it then it collapses and i'm i'm not signed up to this i like the idea of fresh fruit but why just leave it till friday um what I pre would prefer to see is, well, let's look at what we're doing in our workplace that is adversely impacting on people's well-being, whether that be our policies, whether that be the quality of managers. I recall sitting in on some lectures um, at a university I used to work for, whereby the person that was teaching it was a leadership module was saying leadership and management are two different things and I could see a point management's about getting a job done leadership is about doing it in the right way but my argument is a good manager should also have their leadership potential developed and a, a good manager should also be a good leader so that's just it was just a, a point, Stephen. I, I think so many people think well-being is about all this sort of fluffy pink stuff. And it's not me, it's, it that, isn't. It's, it's the hard, are we, you know, I think you know, there's lots of health and safety professionals on the call who understand the hierarchy of risk management. Mm -hmm. And we try and eliminate risk, first of all. Um, and we, you know, in terms of all of this, it's about organisational design in exactly the same way as, you know, we might focus on designing in construction, construction to reduce risk as well. So, um, Anne, I just wanted to stay with you for, for another question. Um, and, um, you know, we've again, we've we've experienced something, you know, significant in the last couple of years. Um, you know, you're, you've got a nursing background, a caring background, um, you know, we, we're very well aware of what our carers have gone through. As health and safety professionals, we've, we've you know, I've never worked like I've worked over the last mm. couple of years. Um, in terms of, of those, you know, the carers that are caring for society, um, I mean, have you got any comments or any insights from from those sectors that you can offer? Mm. I do. I stay in contact with many of my graduates and I often act as a, um, a clinical supervisor where we'll we'll unpick some knotty problems, totally confidential. So I don't know who they're talking about. But one of them was telling me about an intensive care unit where a lot of the staff were having psychological knock-on effects of dealing with the kind of patients they were dealing unsurprisingly if all day you've spent laying out dead bodies when you're not actually wanting to do that you want to get them 
better to go on to a ward, then it's psychologically draining. But she was saying that one of the people that was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder was not actually a clinician. It was the person that was on reception and she had never seen anything like this, but people had forgotten about her. And so I think sometimes you need to dig a little bit deeper to look at what's going on. I was talking to somebody at the at Birmingham uh, conference yesterday who had been working in a senior position within the NHS. She's moved back into the commercial sector now. And she was talking about a nurse who had ended her life by suicide at work. And she worked on an intensive care unit. I hadn't heard about the case, which is surprising because it's in a locality close to me and it hit all the headlines. But I guess I was so busy reading other things that I missed it. But so sad that that person was so destabilized because of the work she was doing, working on an intensive care unit, where it was a bit like being in a, on, in a war zone unprecedented what i really like to see during the pandemic but i suspect that that's now we moved on the things like those relaxation lounges where cabin crew from i think british airways virgin i can't remember the others were running like a first class lounge so that when a staff member had the time to go and take a break they could go to this lounge there'd be food there there'd be um somewhere they could just switch off and that was absolutely marvelous and they the hospitals really stood up and and reacted positively to this awful situation that their staff were in i just hope that degree of support not necessarily having your first class lounges but being aware of the mental health issues associated with healthcare um professional work have been taken forward as well as the physical you know the moving and handling and all those kinds of issues is that yeah. helpful yeah no and, and i think we've done all of this stuff haven't we and we've got it that's the whole point of catch the wave is we've got to continue doing this so we're we're, we're believe it or not we're almost we're rushing through this i'm going to come to um you kelly for one last question and then i'm going to come around the panel to leave your last thoughts and i know you've got a um shield off van so i'll come to you first of all um, so, so just one last um, question from yourself, Kelly, um, and it's kind of tied into Anne's response in respect of that. So, you know, Catch the Wave is all about social sustainability and work isn't just about work, it's about communities, it's about that impact that it has on our families. Um, you know, if, if we've got healthcare workers that, that are going through all of this, they're coming home with all of that. Um, can you just say, you know, Fujitsu is a huge organisation, can you just say something about, um, you know, how you support in terms of a wider community feel and, and why that's important to your organisation? So, and by that, you mean a wider community beyond yeah. our, our direct employees. Yeah, for sure. And what I would what I would say to that is, um, no, lo loads of things, to be honest, but the way in which we support our employees' well-being has a huge knock-on impact on their personal lives, their families, etc. So, so I do firmly agree with the point that Anne made a little bit earlier that well-being an, an organization that cares about well-being is not an organization that simply does the window dressing and says we've got yoga on a monday and we'll give you some fruit on a friday and we do a physical activity thing once a year you know that isn't well-being well well-being is about how you in incorporate um, a, a set of healthy standards into the way that people that people work so by doing that with your with your workforce that will impact their their families but then thinking about well what provision do you have to support worker well-being so if you're offering mental health services can they be available to employees family members and immediate dependents um, during covid some of the things that we did to engage people and get them away from given that most of our workforce is, is doing desk-based work, get them away from their desks a little bit and have some fun. Loads of virtual classes for people and their families mm -hmm. to be part of. Doing social events that families can, can contribute to as well. And then also that connection with each individual 
through their line manager. So what, what's going on for you? Let me check in on how you're doing, what's, what's going on personally, and how do we need to tailor or tweak the support within the workplace to contribute to that? And, and I think a final point for me, it, it, it comes back to the organization's purpose. So at Fujitsu, we, as a Japanese organization, we have a very strong sense of shared purpose, and that is to shape the future of society. That's a really strong social connection, which perhaps makes my job and the, and the job of my colleagues at Fujitsu maybe a little bit easier with the cell around why, why well-being, but bringing it back to how that will help our organizational purpose as well. Fantastic. Do stuff you enjoy. Um, and I'm going to come to you with, because um, I know you've got to shoot off. So your final points and, you know, perhaps a top tip um, for the audience um, that they can take away as, a, a, you know, why are we doing this? A positive top tip from you just to finish off. Um, the, there are costs associated with thinking about well-being, whether that's rejigging your management structure, rejigging your uh, philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. But see it as an investment, not a cost. And for every pound you spend on well-being strategies, you're likely to get significantly more back in productivity. Every time somebody leaves an organisation, there is a cost associated with that recruitment, time spent inducting them into their new job, et cetera, et cetera. If you can make the organization a nicer place to work, maybe you won't be losing so many people that have to move on because they don't like your culture, they don't like your, your um, philosophy, and they don't feel as though you care about their well-being. and it's not just the pink and fluffy bits. Excellent, I love that, not just the pink and fluffy bit. Thank you so much, Anne. Stephen? Um, yeah, so I think my observation on what I see too many organisations doing at the moment is that they're focusing a lot of their time doing the really heroic stuff around patching people up once they're ill um, to get them back to work as soon as possible. Um, and they sort of pat themselves on the back that they've managed to get themselves through a crisis. Um, whereas actually, if you spent more time doing the hardy yards on, you know, going upstream um, and preventing ill health in the first place and identifying risk and so on, you wouldn't have to be so heroic um, and, and have a patching them up uh, approach. And I think that this applies also to things like vocational rehabilitation and return to work. And I think part of the alchemy of all this is using our expertise. You know, people like Anne and colleagues have got great expertise in understanding how you get someone to come back to work after perhaps an injury or an illness and so on. And perhaps just to finish, um, you know, my own situation, um, I've been having cancer treatment for the last two or three years and I've come successfully back to work. And that's partly because I, I work for a great organisation who understands um, you know, why it's important for me to work and values my contribution, but also that they've allowed me to pretty much take control about how I've reorganised my work. Um, I've used some of the principles of job crafting, which I think is something that we ought to be talking about a lot more in this context. Uh, to try and help me to identify the type of tasks or the type of workload uh, situations I get myself in that are good or bad for my health so that I can continue to do as much good work as I possibly can but at the same time making sure that my recovery progresses in a more or less linear fashion and so organizations that are able to tolerate you know job design work organization working time working hours that are not traditional um, but are crafted around the needs of an individual often on a temporary basis, are the ones that are going to make the most impact on um, not just well-being and productivity, but morale, um, motivation and loyalty. Thanks for that, Stephen, and thank you for your part in the panel. And, and I'm going to really test the people in the background now because um, we actually do have a IOSH um, a, a paper that we did. We did some research on back to work, and if somebody in the background can... <laughs> But dig that out and put the link on I'll be really impressed um, and actually to answer um, a question that Chris Neville has put in the um, box about um, uh, panel advice on engagement surveys there's actually a bit another IOSH um, piece of research around behavioural 
um, it was an Irish behavioural study and there's actually a climate tool in the back of that. So I'll be really, really impressed if, if people can dig that out in the background. Um, but Kelly, one last um, point from you or set of just to finish off on a positive note. Yeah, sure. Um, three very quick things. Number one, um, incorporate wellbeing into every day. Simple things that will make a difference um, people's level of well-being on a day-to-day -day basis can make so much more difference than big glamorous well-being initiatives make it specific that people will have time each day away from their work to help their well-being get people involved in designing what well-being looks like in your organization and we've just established a team of well-being champions so we're making sure that there's that immediate source of input into what is going to make the most difference to people and then the third thing is more a bit of kind of professional and um, perspective is that working in these kind of roles can often feel a little bit of a lonely place I'm trying to influence senior leaders who will not see this perspective or, or I feel like I'm fighting a bit of an uphill battle at times to get our most senior people really to care about this stuff as much as I do and I think it's evidenced by some of the comments and the questions in this session today that there is a huge support network out there so lean on your network extend your network as a you know as a result of being part of this session and bring those ideas from outside your organization in and um, in my experience that is often Often really influential when you're getting into some of your trickier conversations to persuade your leaders to do things that's that's fantastic thank you and we have an amazing if anybody wants to um, connect with any of the speakers here on LinkedIn do find us and you'll also um, you know connect with us via our networks branches groups um, I think health and safety professionals have been really good at networking but having spent I've spent actually got out for a couple of days um, this week. I was at the Health and Wellbeing Conference yesterday, and it's about making those personal comments mm -hmm. again. So um, I am, believe it or not, we've, we've come to the end of um, the session. So um, our Catch the Wave initiative is all about what organisations can do to make things better for their people and the benefits of embracing social sustainability across organisations and their supply chains. I very much hope that you've been able to take something away from this webinar and from earlier webinars in the series that will help you to make workplaces more socially sustainable long term for the people who work in them, as well as for their customers and, as we've heard, for our wider communities. If you have not already done so, I strongly encourage you to catch the wave with IOSH and help us to make work a more human centred place. Now, I will be live tomorrow if you haven't had enough of this discussion um, with our Connect with Council virtual session tomorrow. And hopefully um, somebody can put the link on the chat box for anybody who's interested in joining us at noon tomorrow for a live chat and discussion. Um, many thanks to my panel for today for bringing their knowledge, skill and expertise in discussing a very wide subject that we probably could have gone on all day talking about. They have helped to keep, give clarity to the sometimes woolly thinking around this topic. In doing so, they have stimulated us to see how individually and collectively we can play a role in shaping the future world of work. So Kelly, Stephen and Anne, thank you for your contributions today. And of course, thank you to our delegates and for everyone on this call and for everybody watching on Catch Up for joining, listening and learning with us. Our next webinar in the series will take place on Thursday the 28th of April. Its title is OSH Reporting, What Next for Sustainability? Right now on your screen, you will see details of how to get involved and where to go for more information. I personally want to encourage each one of you to visit our campaign page, which you can find easily from the homepage of the IOSH website.
You'll find a whole host of information as well as excellent resources and content relating to the campaign, including the, re the recordings of this webinar series. So with that, I bring this webinar to a close and thank you all for catching the wave with IOSH as we focus on people, sustainability and putting heart into health and safety. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you for joining us and goodbye.